Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I think we can start. Thanks for being at this uh, session. Uh, we have been asked to be efficient with time, so I'm starting right away. So, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here to contribute to the discussion, to this uh, rich conference and the conversation. I want to really thank the organizers for the invitation to be here, and it's an honor to chair this last plenary pa the panel of this very rich conference. So this panel is ambitiously called From Leadership in Thought to Effective Action. And I hope with my colleague panelists that we will be able to deliver to some extent to the, to the title of the panel. So I'll have the pleasure to share the stage uh, with uh, Professor Naibo Jalalic from the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Belgrade and uh, with Professor Tibor Varadi representing the Serbian here, the Serbian Academy of Science and Arts. My name is Anna Canato. I'm from the European Investment Bank, and uh, I am the head of division for education and public research at the European Investment Bank. Um, about this panel, in order to be efficient with time, what we propose is that we will go with the three presentation one after one without leaving space for questions after each presentation. But so these, if we are efficient, should allow us to take some questions at the very end on the three presentation. And so very welcome to ask questions on anything you like. And if we don't have time, I'm sure me as my colleagues, we are very much happy to take questions after or during the dinner to have more time to discuss. So starting with my own presentation. I believe that some of you might be asking yourself what a public investment bank is doing, speaking at a conference about the future of education, or at least this is a question that I get quite often when I come to conferences and workshops about education. And uh, the straightforward and simple answer is that, the simple answer is that we do really care a lot about education. We think that is, it is a very good investment, both for society and for the economy, and we still think it might be beneficial for people in the sector to spell how people that look at what's happening from a different perspective, how we see the evolution of education and how we perceive it from our point of view as financiers and investors. My specific role in the EIB is to lead the team of people who do the appraisals from the technical and the uh, engineering side of the projects that we finance in education and in public research all over the world. Um, so we are not bankers, my team and I, we are not bankers from the strictly sense of the word. We come from different experiences in education and we try to really to see how the sector is evolving and what we can learn of the investment projects that we see happening all over the world. So you probably know a little bit of the, where should I point? Sorry. Let's try to point here. Yes, okay. You probably know a little bit about the European Investment Bank. Um, let me just resume in a couple of words. We are a public non-profit investment bank. We are aligned with the European policies and the money that we lend is important to say uh, we don't lend European funds, we don't give grants. Uh, what we propose are loans from our own resources that we raise from capital markets and that we lend to country, regions, institutions, public and private institutions who, who propose investments that are in line, above all, that are in line globally, aligned globally with European directives and European policies and that are investment projects. And I'm aware that our greatest reputation as an institution comes from investment in infrastructure. You might have heard the AIB for the financing of roads, for the financing of large energy installation or other type of infrastructure. Uh, but yet, when you really think about it, what is education if not the biggest infrastructure, infrastructure that really allows for competitiveness and innovation? What can a country, what can a society really do if you don't have a population who is educated and can be productive but also be knowledgeable 
and be wise about how the world is evolving. This is the background and the spirit with which EIB had started its investment in education since in year 2000. Since that, since that time, we have lent 45, well, I think I'll just do it like that, okay. Since the since year 2000, we have lent 45 billion euros to education projects. The, that is an average of 2.2 billion per year. And when you see that number, the largest majority, like 95%, has been lent in Europe or in other accession, in accession countries. In Serbia, we are very proud to have started the collaboration with the country about 10 years ago. And uh, we have supported and we are we have supported and we are still supporting projects in primary, secondary education, higher education, and also in public research. Um, in uh, what we are doing, what we have been doing in primary and secondary education has enabled the renovation and the construction of about 280 schools today, something that we are very proud of. And in hearing the Prime Minister this morning talking about the importance of education and the the interest of renewing education even and even more. This is something that is really important for us because it's really aligned with how we see the relevance of the sector in itself. So it's probably not very well known, but we are one of the two biggest lenders in the education space together with the World Bank. And uh, we co-finance investment from pre-primary to higher education and uh, public research or so research laboratories, scientific park. It's important to say that as an institution, we don't do business development. We don't go to a country to say what they should be doing. What we want, what we do is look at the investment projects that are already present in a given space and then offer our support also to structure and implement the project in a way that can lead to the greatest impact that as financiers we can help having. So in uh, looking at that, sorry for the introduction about the institution, but in my experience, this is often not well known about what we do. So I thought it was useful to share with you. Um, how do we see the education world? How do we see it changing? Our investment survey say that lack of skills is currently the biggest obstacle to innovation. And since we have started this survey a couple of years ago, this is a very striking result that really holds true in almost all European, in all European country. When you ask, when we ask our investors, what is holding you back to invest more? What, why are you not doing more? The result is always that there is a lack of people with the right skills. And uh, as here, as we have also heard in the presentation before, what we see is that this lack of skills are not just professional skills. They are not just how to do a specific job. Some of these skills are things that are more related to inter interdisciplinary skills, to how to work together, how to work with multicultural people, which are skills that really should be learned. We hear our experts tell us that should be learned much earlier in, uh, in education and primary and secondary school. So we really see that there are a lot of challenges that the education sector face, challenges that maybe are not the usual challenges, and that's what I'm hearing from many, from many of the presentation that I've listened to today, that the education sector is facing some challenges and also some opportunities that are very, very different from, or they are significantly different from what they have been facing before. And these challenges might need responses, answers, uh, innovative initiatives that are different from what has been doing in the past. So, in face of that, what is that we know about the resources? What is that we know about how many resources are used in, in education? Um, when we look at the resources of the sector, actually what we hear, there are many investment studies, and they, but I, I like to cite something that was told us by one of a large European country, which I mean, just tell us, we do have resources in education for doing investments, but only to cover what is absolutely necessary and urgent. There are no investment resources for what is more, less than immediately urgent. 
An important investment study that was developed by the Euro Com European Commission tried to estimate the investment needs in the education world, so going from primary to higher education, and they estimated it at 15 billion euro per year, or across all Europe. This was, uh, this was a result that was based under the assumption that we could progress with a business as usual scenario. So with no transformation, with no innovation, with no radical changes on how education happens. And we all know again, if I'm hearing the conversation that is, uh, that is going in this room, that is it not really what our what education needs, that probably the needs are larger and more substantial. The key question then becomes why education does not have the amount of resources that they should, that are needed in the sector. And probably that is, there is not a single uh, very good answer, at least in our experience to that. Uh, what we see is that education, we like to say it in this way, education needs patient money. Education, fortunately and unfortunately, is an investment that needs a lot of time to realize impact. If you want it, you start, if you change the way a primary school children is learning today, you will most likely be able to measure the real result in 25 years' time. You don't really win elections with this type of promises, why it is much more likely to lose elections with this type of promises. And that's why we think, at least as a public financier, we think it's very important to keep talking about the support that education needs, because it's something that really needs time to develop and time to produce result. So when we invest in education, and this is our perspective on the sector, we do it for three main reasons. First, reasons. First because we think that this is a very good investment for the innovativeness, from the competitiveness, for the cohesion of a country and for reducing the inequalities in the countries. And whichever country we talk about, this is also very good for Europe at all, in general. The second reason is, is the reason is that we know from studies that improving educational infrastructure is something that is useful for educational outcome. At least, usually, it does not harm educational outcome, while hopefully, well, surely, improving and helping the planet as we make more climate resilience infrastructure. But the third reason, and uh, something that is deeply important for us, is that we hope that every time that we finance an education project, uh, this is something that can help the institution, can help the sectoral expert, can help the, the school administrator to really bring in changes in how they are developing innovation. Um, the way in which we support innovation projects is by supporting education infrastructure, equipment, but also teacher trainings, teacher training. And in, uh, more and more we believe that this is really the area we should be looking to, for. That we really hope that when there is an investment in, um, when there is, sorry, when there is an investment, where is my slide, yes. Uh, when we are supporting school reorganization, where we are helping any country to perhaps to be, increase the number of schools or reduce the number of schools in light of demographic needs, these can really be used by promoters, by sectoral experts, also as an opportunity to uh, bring in pedagogical changes, to bring in, bring in new approaches to teaching, and to increase the involvement of, t of teachers and other people that are impacted by the project. And this is where we, our investors, we also see our role as sometimes we can mobilize other funds related to the commission or related to technical assistance to really try to shape the project that we bring forward. I had titled my intervention uh, Effective Learning Environments, and although I reshaped it a little bit after hearing some conversations um, today, and I think that for us as investors, we often ask ourselves, whether if there is really a best way in which a new school can be designed, is there a best way in which a new learning environment can be designed? 
And I mean, I'm curious personally if there is any evidence of that here. I think I am in the room where I might have people who have more evidence and experience. Um, but from our, from what we have seen so far in different countries, we don't see a best way that is valid across all countries. What we see, what we see though, is um, possibly a good way to structure an education innovation project that is by making sure that there is a vision and a strategy and this is something and, uh, and to align this with what the projects need to achieve so to make sure that there is an education program an education strategy behind what country a region a municipality wants to achieve that there is a good involvement of school actors at the various stage of the process this is something that again in our experience following education projects across all europe this is something that is going, we know is going to improve the way in which the project is put in place. And last but not least, to really provide support to teachers in terms of training, in terms of monitoring, in terms of continuous support. The last studies from the, uh, from the European Commission, the annual monitoring tool of the Commission, really points at the needs of teachers in Europe, how they can be, how they really need to be supported in this type of transformation. Because uh, when we talk about digital training, when we talk about multicultural classroom, these can, that certainly can be impacted by the use of equipments and by new infrastructure, but the equipment infrastructure alone will not be able to bring impact unless the people is involved. So I think our call in this, in this conference is on the one way to uh, be ambitious in investments in education, not just because we can sponsor it, but because we really think that is, and there is evidence that this is something that Europe, in general, Europe, well, our focus is Europe, but the entire world needs. And second, not to forget that as investors, we can also provide a role in terms of sponsoring the project and making sure, thank you, that the project is carried out in a way that will, support, will be supported over the years and also to use us as monitoring tools of what is happening in the project and whether the project is, um, is reaching its impact. Um, I took with me a couple of examples that's to show you Typically classical examples of what the bank is doing and has been doing in the last years. Um, I will not go in details, but if you go on our website, you will have all the examples and I'm surely available to explain. For example, this is a project we did uh, in France. Saint-Saint-Denis is the poorest region of uh, France, although it's on the outskirts of Paris. And there we really, we supported the renovation and reconstruction of a number of secondary schools which had behind a strong vision of how they wanted to change pedagogy in the secondary, uh, in the secondary level of education. So we, uh, and we see as the project progressed that this is something that really, the infrastructure were useful to enable changes that were transforming the overall environment while the school take place. Um, this is not very different from what, for example, we will be doing in Montenegro, which is something that we is a project that we just signed recently about renovation of kindergartens and primary schools in Montenegro. A second example is more is with higher education, and this is a, this is an example of the University of Latvia, where again we support. This was the first project we did in Latvia, and we helped the national. Uh, public university to restructure their structure, their building, and find a way, find a way to put together and improve the way in which researchers were interacting by putting them in the same buildings, by building new laboratories, and by enabling an overall reconstruction of the country. And we have many projects like this across Europe, including uh, sa some of them also in Serbia. Thanks a lot for your attention. And um, as promised, I will now pass the, my, the, the floor to my colleague, so the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Belgrade, Nebo Jalalic. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak this evening and uh, for this uh, executive function of bringing this bell at uh, 12 minutes, but I think I did it successfully. So uh, my, my task of this evening is a little bit more focused than my predecessors. Uh, uh, I will be talking about life sciences and medicine and uh, some future if uh, that can be foreseen. Uh, in a way, some improvements in pedagogy and old world for the future, as, as you can see. Uh, that's why I will focus first on pedagogy and uh, uh, trying to remind us that it is the art of teaching, which we might, uh, forgot, uh, might have forgotten it a little bit. But anyway, it is a sort of uh, um, uh, it is a sort of making a difference in the intellectual and social development of students uh, by by giving additional uh, knowledge in the way of science and theory or or uh, skill uh, in uh, the way of art or practice. What does it mean in, in life sciences? In life sciences, it has been recognized a while ago. In 1956, uh, there was a famous Bloom's taxonomy that uh, uh, depicted the order in which uh, the uh, future researcher should be educated, uh, saying that uh, everything should start from uh, understanding and remembering on some basic principles. And then uh, to put them in another environment in which they would apply it, analyzed, finally evaluated, and put them in the front of the new problem, which would uh, finally uh, come to uh, or, or produce a sort of creation, a new original work. And uh, nowadays, we are a little bit more practical. And in the um, recommendations of uh, American Society of Cell Biology, uh, it says that uh, you should start uh, if you are te uh, educating a new researcher, uh, that you sh uh, should start your lesson with clear learning objectives, not going that, uh, that, 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 uh, that far away like in Bloom's taxonomy. And to explain fundamental concepts before digging into, into complicated ideas. And then uh, switch to something which is a characteristic of a new coming world, and this is the use of multiple teaching approaches through a sort of formative assessment, then uh, uh, which helps uh, students understanding and implement active learning, which was not too much, uh, too much focused uh, in, uh, in the previous years at the beginning. And uh, regarding the, uh, the multiple teaching approaches, you can see that there is, uh, there is a, 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 the whole spectrum of them, uh, starting from storylines that are explicitly driven by a student, uh, there are questions that are coming uh, uh, during the education process, then through the resource playlist uh, in which uh, a lot of biointeractive resources are invented, through the workshops in which the students are those ones that are conducting, and finally the whole um, bunch of, of literature that, uh, that can be used uh, in this process. So all that is uh, teaching support, a support to the teaching that has to have a certain, certain order into which uh, you are implementing it. When we switch now to medicine, we should uh, remember that uh, uh, becoming a physician makes uh, means going through all these steps uh, that are more or less covering your own life. Uh, so you are starting with pre-med uh, in some, in some uh, countries, then you are going uh, through the medical studies, then you are going through the CME afterwards, and the licensing, uh, and all the rest. So the education is a sort of continuous process, uh, voluntarily or involuntarily. At the same time, however, uh, during uh, doing the, the medical job is facing the uh, changes in the healthcare delivery, which is uh, especially in the last century coming from uh, uh, resolving acute problems uh, with your clinical skills uh, through a sort of relationship in one physician versus one patient to chronic diseases, which uh, has to involve the teamwork 
uh, which uh, um, means interactions not only with patients but also with other healthcare profiles, and a lot of knowledge from population health and community. So, uh, what is expected uh, of the physician of 20, uh, 21st century, at least according to the Federation uh, for Medical Education in Canada? Uh, the physician should be skilled. He would, should be uh, able to adapt to, to new, or at one side, to new knowledges, and uh, uh, which, which means new interventions, personalized therapeutics, but however, to the changing of pattern of illnesses on the other side. So the physician, in a way, will need to be independent and critical thinker, capable of prizing evidence free from personal bias and inappropriate influence, and also to manage uncertainty uh, and to do a sort of non-algorithmic work. Uh, how to, uh, to achieve that? Uh, the, uh, the, the course of medical education, of course, involves, first of all, the classroom, which now flourishes with different uh, technical miracles in which uh, a lot of theoretical knowledge can be presented. But however, uh, and of course, uh, this is a tradition, then you go to the hospital or clinic in which uh, a lot of new inventions are applied to with tablets, with uh, wearable technology, with some use of social media and so on. But however, there is something in between, some step that uh, um, relates the first and the third uh, the third part of this, uh, this graph, and that is a simulation center, which is the invention of these years and probably of the future, in which you are trying to, uh, in fact, uh, dupli duplicate the, the, the situation in, in a control environment and to, to test uh, the ability of the students to, uh, to resolve different problems. But however, we should not neglect uh, some independent learning that comes uh, through uh, different uh, e-textbooks uh, e e uh, and uh, uh, also social media and other aspects that are contributing to this education. So uh, it, the thinking has just uh, come outside of the box, definitely, and uh, we should try to put it in a certain, in a certain track in order to uh, obtain f uh, the, the, the overall results. Uh, what about simulators? Uh, Simulation-based learning is very much spread out. And uh, it is important to really uh, design uh, uh, an appropriate dimensions of this, uh, uh, the, how, how this simulation should be used and to what extent it should be replacing the, the, the really uh, bedside clinical experience. But however, simulation is not that much new. Uh, if you come uh, to the previous century, even to the 19th century, from the big aula of uh, the, the, the oldest universities, you saw this type of uh, shadowing, if you wish, which was a sort of simulation of the process, which is now very much uh, put on a higher technological level, but uh, uh, showing more or less the same thing. And this is uh, show, showing the process that is uh, uh, that uh, um, the students are watching and following. Then uh, it, you are coming uh, also to some more integrating, uh, integrating e-learning, which is now not uh, not uh, connected to the patient or to the uh, very practical work as it was previously. And you can see the whole range of, uh, of, of things when, uh, that can be used, that are offered to, uh, through, through the e-learning. And finally, not to mention uh, the possibilities that the internet and uh, the social media, which are uh, numerous, which are endless, and where you can find everything. Uh, I will repeat, where you can find everything. But this year, um, uh, uh, this year, uh, this uh, British Medical Council, in, in the in the Journal of Bedi uh, Medical Education um, of British Medical Council, a sort of word of caution has been uh, put in, uh, and, uh, and it says that unless there is further modification, the new integrated curricula are at risk to produce graduates deficient 
in the characteristics that have set physicians apart from other healthcare professionals, namely high level of clinical expertise that they would be deprived for, from, uh, and uh, going deep grounding into medi biomedical sciences and also understanding of pathological basis of the disease, but to the extent that it is needed for clinical expertise. It should be, however, uh, forgive me for maybe my one-sided view, it should be in the function of the clinical expertise, despite of the plethora of, uh, of possibilities that we, that we have it. So this is my final slide. Uh, in the medical teacher of this year, of last year, sorry, it has been described uh, how medical schools should be transformed uh, from the ivory tire, uh, tower to the real world, for, uh, to the just-in-time learning, to the adequate combination of basic sciences and clinical medicine, uh, to uh, escape and to avoid undervaluating under teaching and teachers, to student as a partner, to, uh, to medical studies not being a mystery tour, but a mapped journey, to adaptive curriculum and adaptive learning, to creative use of technology and program-focused assessment, and finally, to the great collaboration with everybody that can make medical education better. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So now with the last presentation of the, this panel, Professor Tibor Varadi representing the Serbian Academy of Science and Art. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, um, during the session uh, before this one, uh, my colleague, academician Popovic, mentioned Tito, uh, the Yugoslav leader during many decades of communism. So let me also mention Tito because I found a newspaper a couple of days ago in old files. It's a newspaper from March 17th, 1952. Uh, my father was um, reading every day the Belgrade Politica and the Hungarian minority Magyarsó. I read this in the Magyarsó that uh, Tito at March 15th at 5 p.m. had a talk with the Yugoslav Association of Higher Education. Uh, Tito said to people representing higher education that the main task of universities is to create a new man with new skills. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this aim has survived communism. But what has also survived communism is a complete lack of clear perception and definition of what is actually a new man with new skills. Some guidance was actually given by Tito. He said that education must not be restricted to expertise. University youth must be engaged in politics, according to Tito, on the road of becoming a new man with new skills. At this point, I somewhat disagree with Tito, and I guess I'm not the only one here. Uh, I guess Tom Nichols would disagree too, who wrote recently a really excellent book on dangerous antipathy towards expertise and skepticism towards intellectual authority. The title of the book is The Mirage of Knowledge. But let me say that uh, what permitted, what allowed me to remain in academia after communism, actually in several countries and several com continents, was definitely not political engagement. It was indeed expertise. What may have helped me also was luck. I was lucky to get my doctor's degree at Harvard Law School. But I didn't get expertise only at Harvard. I also got expertise during my studies at the Belgrade Law School. Even classical subjects, like Roman law, brought me somewhat closer to contemporary law of international trade, which became my main sphere of research, because some rules, some way of thinking in Roman law um, permitted me to perceive problems which are not limited to problems within Roman times. 
But again, um, political phrases are and were completely unhelpful. Political faithfulness can only secure a position until the new elections. Now let me say that the perception of an aim that Tito qualified in the most blunt way has not completely vanished. It is only communicated today in a more subtle way. Outright explicit political aims uh, earlier were framed and expressed as party line. Now I, in a much more subtle way, uh, phrased as trends. Yet just as politics uh, do, trends may also divorce us from truly scientific and scholarly perception of the reality around us. Party line cannot and should not replace thinking. Trends should not replace it either. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that globalization is nowadays becoming a reality. It is definitely a challenge. It is also perceived as a trend that needs to be followed. We also have to be careful in our approach to globalization. At this moment of history, globalization is present among us both as a reality and at the same time as a slogan. If we try to follow an academic approach, we should, we should divorce the issue of globalization from slogans. I see here uh, two distinct dangers. One is the danger to follow a phenomenon that is actually truly worth attention, uh, a, reali a reality that uh, requires to be investigated, but to follow it as a trend and to allow to be guided or carried by a swing without stopping from time to time to see where we actually are. And also there's a danger to perceive a new occurrence in our environment as the definite and final future. Let me say that uh, slogans, phrases, replacing thinking were much more easily ascertainable and perceptible under communism, but haven't ceased after communism. I remember a conference, uh, it was in Zagreb, a Yugoslav conference where uh, there were academicians from all Yugoslav republics. It was devoted to higher education, and after a while I found it somewhat less than exciting and I started to note how many times a speaker mentions uh, socialist democracy and how many times mentions socialist self-management. And according to the statistics, it was about 16 to 18 times per every speaker. Every speaker was speaking about 10 minutes. And then in the late 90s, I attended a conference on higher education in Western Europe and um, again, I was taking some notes how many times the speakers mentioned sustainable development. It was about 18 to 19 times. So there are some things which did not change. I would say that socialist democracy is below the level of sustainable development, but just at that time, if you wanted to earn a project and financing for a project, it was definitely helpful to mention socialist democracy. Today, if you are uh, trying to get a project financing and you mention sustainable development, your chances are better. So by abandoning communism, we haven't abandoned every threat, every intellectual threat under communism. And now the question is, where should I put globalization within the sphere of academia. Let me start with an example of my own experience. Since this is my experience, I'm not really impartial. I'm considering this as a success, but as a lawyer, I know that only neutral persons can give a valid judgment about a success. Uh, what happened is the following, that while I was studying at Harvard, I, uh, I was studying American law. 
But uh, when I was getting some conversation with some professors, I learned that practically all of them studied something different. Those who studied at Harvard studied Massachusetts law. Those who studied at Yale studied Connecticut law. Those who studied at Berkeley uh, studied California law. And then they started teaching American law. What happened? What happened is not that Massachusetts law ceased to exist. There is indeed an American constitution, but there are still rules in civil law in particular, and in many other areas as well, which are specific New York rules, Massachusetts rules, Iowa rules, or Florida rules, or whatever rules. But there was a lot of uh, harmonization, a lot of approach, and what has not become yet a full reality as American law has become teachable. And this is an interesting uh, thing which I noticed there, and I'm of course not the only one who noticed there, that um, teaching something can somewhat precede a full reality and can actually promote a reality. And this gave me I the idea to write a law on international commercial arbitration, which is my main field of research, um, in a global perspective. And to call it uh, international com commercial arbitration, a transnational approach. This is not for the reason that uh, there is no specific uh, German act and French act and Serbian act on international commercial arbitration. But uh, because there is a lot of harmonization, there are international conventions, and uh, international commercial arbitration has indeed become teachable as a transnational course. And uh, this year I was lucky, the seventh edition of this book appeared, and it is really uh, used on all five continents. So what I'm trying to say is that globalization is definitely a chance. But I am also trying to say that uh, we should uh, consider this not as a trend, not as a fashion, but as a fact, and we should not and must not exclude doubt. If you ask me whether this should apply to all legal courses, my answer is clearly no. If you ask me uh, whether it shall apply at uh, more courses, then the most precise answer I could give is uh, we shall see. Uh, there are many courses in which, uh, and I'm talking about law, and it probably applies to many other areas in a different way, in a different approach, different fashion. Um, so globalization has become a part of our reality, but it is not simply our world, it is a part of our world. Uh, and within academia, this is something what needs to be uh, investigated and reinvestigated time and again. Uh, the question is also whether globalization is the future. And before us, we had a session on um, digitalization. And again, one can ask whether this is the future. And again, I would uh, give a we shall see answer. I don't think that digitalization is a greater breakthrough than uh, the Gutenberg uh, uh, revolution was um, more than a century ago, more than two centuries ago. Um, the question is, uh, today those who are studying have to be aware of digitalization, and it is also very helpful. Is this their future? I would here uh, keep an open mind. And I think what we should teach is not only a readiness what is now the present uh, uh, innovation, but a readiness for future innovations as well, just as um, when I was studying under communism, uh, the main gain was uh, readiness for uh, future radical changes and not what was at that time uh, new. Let me also mention that 
this electronic environment we are, uh, is being shaped around us is getting a lot of praise, and I agree. It is also getting some um, uh, criticism. One speaks about um, electronic illiteracy. Let me also cite Marshall McLuhan, who said that to develop individuals with powerful minds and individual characters is to create a supply for which there is no demand. Why train men if there is only a market for robots? Now, this is, of course, an irony. Uh, this is not a line uh, to be followed or even proposed by Marshall McLuhan, but I think uh, that uh, parallel with a justified enthusiasm about new electronic changes, a doubt should also be part of a scholarly approach. Let me finish by saying that I am proud that my transnational arbitration casebook uh, is a step towards globalization, but it is very important, and I believe in it, to draw a distinction between believing in something and taking something seriously. I think that uh, globalization is not something we should merely believe in it, we should take it seriously. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. We are a little bit short with time, but if there are a couple of quick questions, I think we can take it. Take them. I don't. There's nobody with the microphone, so. We can speak up. Thank you. <laughs> so. Yeah. Please. Uh, I have a question to the in person presentation concerning the, uh, in the education of the medical doctors. Uh, you gave a very coherent picture. Thank you. Thank you very much for so many questions, but I will, uh, I will go one by one. Uh, uh, th th this is a sort of a way to go that I, uh, that I explained, I mean, and about which uh, almost everybody agrees. But uh, the, the changes are not easy uh, in a way that uh, um, once you would like to, uh, to uh, go a little bit away from the classical lectures and practice, uh, you are facing a lot of problems. Uh, one of the major, uh, one of the most important illustration uh, of, uh, uh, of these problems are, uh, are uh, the, the destiny of so-called uh, problem-based learning. Uh, it was a, s a sort of uh, um, approach that has been favored, especially in Western Europe, in which you were left uh, on a symptom and on your own without knowing, uh, without uh, 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 at the beginning uh, uh, an adequate lecture, an adequate practice, and to find the solution after a week of just searching everywhere, internet, this and that and so on, and uh, uh, how the students made it somehow. Some of the universities made some adaptations. But at the end of the day, there was a research showing that uh, the retention of the knowledge is the same between the classical way of learning and uh, problem-based learning. So that was a sort of disadvantage in these uh, big, uh, big endeavors to change it. But however, what is, what is important is that uh, 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 the, the, uh, and, and what has already been done, is a s uh, sort of uh, uh, integration of uh, different uh, classical subjects uh, like anatomy, physiology, and so on into different, uh, different uh, grouping uh, of, uh, based on, 
organ-based or uh, uh, disease-based or there are, there are other uh, restructuring of the medical curricula and uh, there is even a slide that I omitted here and that has shown that even the recommendation is to make a sort of curricula that you would like to do, then to test it and in a way to squeeze it. I mean to make it in a, in a third step more rational. Uh, so uh, th that is how the, uh, the uh, and that is an eternal discussion in a number of uh, uh, European at least, but also international associations for medical education uh, through which uh, m uh, different, uh, uh, d different aspects of the implementation is, is already done in, at, some, at some universities. Regarding research, um, uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, the, uh, a couple of years ago even, a couple, uh, even a decade ago, it has been very popular to speak about the sort of combined MD-PhD studies, uh, which uh, would uh, then, uh, um, however, allow the space for the organized teaching for research together with the teaching for medical practice. Uh, mm, this has not uh, come too far away. I mean, not many universities has applied it, but uh, however, a number of those that did, uh, did not go too much away from the summing up of the courses, or at pa of the parts of the courses, and not to make a sort of mixing of the two, 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 two ways of doing it. Regarding the, 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 the healthcare provision, um, it is uh, then, um, it becomes like, uh, s uh, it has added uh, um, another aspect uh, to the whole thing and uh, put uh, all, uh, extended the, the duration of this education to almost the whole practice until retirement of a particular physician. Because, uh, if, for example, in, in the States, that's not that much in Europe, but in the States, you are, uh, you are striving to go for another license, to be tested and retested and retested again to get a better ranking at the market of, uh, of, 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 of doctors which I think it's a lot sort of frenzy. But however, uh, this, uh, uh, the, the, the practice uh, uh, does not uh, that much uh, influence uh, the, 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 the content of uh, something that you do through CME, but more uh, the, the, the requirements of the community of uh, physicians that are really deciding about that. I'm very sorry. I need to cut the time for questions because we are already after. We, if you want to have a very quick coffee in three minutes, we need to shiv now. We need to close now also not to be unfair because there is a full time for presentation. So I suggest we take the questions maybe over the coffee and